do and we can solve a lot of these problems that we've been talking about this morning just through the use of no-till and cover crop. So this is some pictures off of that same field. Look at the runoff that we're seeing there. This is with a what would be called a conservative tillage method uh, called vertical tillage. So that, that's clearly not really benefiting us a whole lot. Here's some more pictures. These are all local Racine County pictures here. So when I drove by this field, I actually had to stop by and sample it. And, and I sent in the nutrient sample, and that is some of the best. Most farmers throughout the Midwest would, would, it, would do anything to have that soil. And they, there's not a farmer out there that wants to let it go. Uh, but look at the nutrients. We got 163 pounds of nitrogen. That can grow a pretty good corn crop in itself. So we're, they are letting that stuff blow away, but we're, we're doing some things and we're creating some efforts to fix that. So uh, soil degradation is a big thing throughout the entire world. And you can see, here we go. Um, we're right in the middle of, of, of some of the worst, uh, most degraded soil in the world. So we have to continue to fix this. And, and luckily we've got a good group of farmers that are starting to do it. And, and we are making some progress. Uh, it's just, it takes time. You know, the biggest thing that slows anybody from change is fear. And, and it's hard for farmers to, to make that jump. And, and, but they are definitely doing it. And, and remember the farmers have plowed ever since the very beginning. Uh, that's how they always got their, their, their seed established and their crops grown. So this is a big mindset to get them to change, but luckily we are making some progress. So I, I actually borrowed this from a good friend of mine, Dr. Ellen Williams. Uh, upon this handful of soil, our survival depends. Husband it, and it will grow our food or fuel in a shelter and surround us with beauty. Abuse it, and the soil will collapse and die. So this is what we want to stop. This is just part of our issue. We've heard a lot about flooding and water quality this morning. And there's not, as I could say, yeah, as we all know, and anybody who's been watching the news, we all know about what, what the Western states, like we get into Nebraska and the Dakotas have been going through. Uh, there's not a farm out there that wants to deal with that. And we don't want the cities to have to deal with it either. So the good thing here too, we can start soil testing. There's a new test called the Haney test. Um, and, and it gives us the ability to, to actually measure what's available in the soil and what's tied up in plant life and, and biological activity so we can see what's available. But we know that the top meter of the soil contains thousands of tons of minerals per acre. It's just up to us to use some diversity to get to it. Uh, there's a the specific microbial function groups uh, have access to that mineral fraction, which we need to increase those groups. And, uh, we do that by, by feeding more liquid carbon into, from the plants. Uh, the, the high pot potassium and phosphorus fertilizers actually inhibit our ability to do that. So we, that's part of the reason we need to decrease the use of that. And then these classic models for soil carbon dynamics are based on the conventional practices. So our basic farm test, our basic soil test, is basically set up for our dysfunctional fields. So that's just another change that these farms have to get used to doing is using a new test that they're not quite comfortable with because they don't have a lot of experience with it, but we're getting more and more of them to use those tests and, and in return, now we can start cutting back on some nutrients because of the diversity that we're getting in our fields. So just a few facts here. I wanted to touch on a couple of these. We have 30,000 tons of nitrogen per acre in our atmosphere. So we really want to do whatever we can to capture as many of those tons of nitrogen and get it down into our soil. Uh, the other thing I really wanted to touch on is a corn soybean alternation is less than 50% efficient in creating or collecting solar energy. And what that means is, you know, we might plant corn in April and we might harvest it in, in October, but that doesn't mean we're capturing solar energy because probably in about September that plant is dead and then it's starting to dry out, so we're no longer capturing solar energy. So what we're trying to do with cover crops is we're trying to get cover crops established before the harvest so we can start capturing those, the, the solar energy at that point in time, and then we can start cycling that, those nutrients and, and uh, capturing that solar energy, putting it back in the ground and, and feeding it through the red exudates to feed the, the soil. 
So nutrient calibration. Uh, there's a lot of benefits in, in, in cover crops, but a big thing is holding nutrients. And, and as we've talked about already, we need to do whatever we can to capture these nutrients. And, and this is some of the stuff that we've got some really good farmers working on. But now we have the ability to measure the nutrients that we're, that we're working on. And radishes are just the first one that we've been testing on. So we can take this, uh, we can go out and we can and measure our radishes that we get. And say after, if we added a small grain, we could get six inch radishes. Uh, if we could get four of them per square foot, we've got 79 pounds of nitrogen and so on and so forth. There's a $64 value. Well, for a farmer, it probably only costs $15 to get that established. So now they can give themselves that kind of credit. That's gonna make them that much more profitable the next year if they can, if they can reduce their inputs by that much. So in, in Iowa, we did a case study a couple years ago. Uh, there was some prevent plant ground that we couldn't do anything with, so, uh, or we couldn't get a cash crop planted in there. So we were able to get out there in August and get it planted. And this is what the field looked like. And, and this was just a straight stand of radishes, which we don't recommend anymore, but this is what we were trying to do at the time was we were trying to do some research here. And what we, what we saw uh, was our nutrient uptake. We did add 60 pounds at planting of nitrogen and this, well, this, this was mostly a nitrogen study, but we had 364 pounds of nitrogen uptake in that system. So where was the rest of that nitrogen coming from? We were, it was in the soil. We were able to go down. We know radishes will go down. Uh, they've got 260 PSI. They can go down in and pull nutrients up from way below. We've traced radish roots as far as eight feet down. So we were capturing nutrients and bringing it back up. Uh, so then what we did after that is we did some tests where we did uh, nutrient applications where we did zero added nitrogen, 50 pounds, 100 and 150, and all the way up to 200. And what we saw was if we just added 50 pounds, we got 237 bushel of corn where we didn't do any, we had 183. Well, if we go back to the last slide, we had 364 pounds and, and a lot of farms think it takes one pound of nitrogen to grow one bushel of corn, which we don't really believe that anymore, but that's that was kind of the common thought for a long time. So the question was, why did we need to add 50? We shouldn't have had to add any to get that kind of yield. Well, th then we started to learn about carbon to nitrogen ratio. And carbon to nitrogen ratio is, is the, the kind of how the plant is, is built and, and how the breakdown or how fast the breakdown is going to be. So uh, straw, for instance, is an 80 to 1 carbon to nitrogen ratio. So that's going to take a long time, like wheat straw is going to take a long time for those nutrients to become available in the field, where a radish is very soft. It's, it's got a very low carbon and nitrogen ratio. Those so what happened in this situation is the nutrients became so available so fast that the corn couldn't keep up with it and started to, to leave. So we were able to, so basically what we've come up with is we need to have diverse mixes to slow down the release of these nutrients so we can capture it as the, as the next cash crop can use it. Um, so when we when we develop cover crop blends, we, we usually want to try and look at what our goals are and, and uh, figure out what we want to plant and how our blends gonna gonna mix up. And then we got to look at how long we've been in a system because that's gonna also completely change. If we've been in a system for a long time, it's gonna break down really really fast because we have so much more biological activity. If we're just getting started in a system, we want to change that and have a lower carbon to nitrogen ratio. So where can we plant cover crops on farming acres? The good thing is we can plant them everywhere and we're just finding out how to get it established. Uh, so there's gonna be a lot of farms that are gonna say, well, I just don't have time after corn or after beans. Well, now we can go in between and we're gonna talk about how we're doing that. A lot of our, a lot of our other issues has been, we don't have the equipment to get this established. And this is just a couple new ways that we're gonna be planting. Uh, in order to do that, you see we haven't done any tillage, we're just going right out and we're planting right into the field. And the picture with the roller on the front, thats we're starting to see more and more of that where they're actually rolling or eye down with that. And, and not, not in that picture, but then they'll just plant right into that rolled eye. Uh, the planter, the other planter actually has roller crimpers on each planter unit so they can drive into it and they can plant it and roll it all together. Uh, we can go out and drill. I like to show this to farmers, and I, I forgot to say that earlier on, about 95% of the people I talk to are farmers, so I always like to rub this one into them. But we, we've got a couple options in, in how we can get stuff planted, and 
we can just no-till drill or we can continue with what we do. And when we lose that soil structure, as you go back to the slate test, you can tell there's not a lot of soil structure. A lot of that soil's already disappeared. So that that gives the tractors the ability to, or, or, or the inability to stay afloat where in a no-till system, we really have the ability to stay above the soil surface. Uh, white mold is a big issue in farming, especially with soybeans and, and planting like this is, is one of the major benefits for uh, for the farmer. So if they can plant right into that, think of what that's doing for water quality, but, but also it's really benefiting the farmer as well because what white mold is, it's a spore in the soil. And if we can keep that spore locked in the soil by, by creating a barrier, when we get a heavy rainfall, now those splashing is gonna splash back up off of the rye, not off of the soil. So it's protecting that soil, um, keeping that in the ground, and then keeping the bean healthy. So I just did a little cost comparison here of what we see a lot of farmers do, and, and we uh, typically will see a lot of vertical tillage tools uh, that's the BT disc and then a disc ripper in the fall and then come back with a spring cultivating pass in the spring before planting. Uh, where if we just do the, the drilling of the cover crop and then say the winter rye cover crop, we're saving $24 to $31 an acre, but we're also seeing a consistent 3 to 6 bushel yield increase. So not only are we saving money on the input side, but we're also seeing better yields and, and higher profits that way. So this is what some of the fields are gonna look like. It, you know, you got your corn field on your left and, and the bean field on the right, and that's creating a map in between. So we may, a lot of times we still may need to use a herbicide, but we can maybe just use one herbicide instead of two or three passes. And that's, there again, every farmer wants to use less because it's, it's it kind of affects them financially. So here's just some more pictures of where we planted green. Uh, this. I'll tell you, this is really, really scary for a farmer that's always been used to planting into black fields. So we're, uh, this was actually in this farmer situation here uh, on your right. This was his first time ever doing it and it had got really wet. So he wasn't able to get out as early as he wanted to, uh, but he, that ended up, that was the best thing he ever did. Now he plants almost everything that way. And this is what it looked like uh, shortly after that, the, the picture there on the, on your left is when the corn was just coming up out of the ground and then the picture on the right is you can see the corn is up a lot taller and now the rye starting to decay. Uh, this is just showing our ability to increase yields when we get farmers to do that. This is actually following a sugar beet harvest where we seeded winter cereal rye in October of 2017. Uh, they planted green in, in May um, with a herbicide pass seven days after and they harvested 73.67 bushels of beans per acre. Um, it was 23 bushels better than any of their other conventional till. That doesn't always happen, but sometimes we get lucky. So, uh, but we always see a, a slight yield increase, but that was, that was substantial. So why are we seeing that? We're seeing increased water infiltration because we're capturing more of that water where it rains, uh, or the rain where, where it lands. Uh, we're seeing earlier maturing beans, so it gives us an earlier opportunity to get out there and get it harvested. Uh, we're seeing an end tie up early and, and soybeans like nitrogen late, but they don't always like it early because they are a legume. So as we tie up those nutrients uh, early on and tie up that nitrogen and then it releases as that rye starts to decompose, now that's around pot fill time and that's another reason why we're seeing increased yields. And then if you've been around farming at all, there's a lot of talk about Roundup resistant weeds. Uh, this is giving us an ability to choke out a lot of those weeds, so, so therefore we can use less herbicide. Uh, just, I wanted to show this picture. This is just showing the difference. On, on your left, that's a, a corn field that was planted directly into a winter kill cover crop versus on the right was the conventional tilt system. And this is after a two month dry spell. And you can, I don't know if you can see it very well in this picture from, from down there, but on the right, that corn is really starting to curl up and dry up. And on the left, that, that's, the plant is out capturing all the sunlight. It's still really healthy because it still has access to moisture. So some of the cover crop myths that, that a lot of people think is their soil never will never warm up. And we're actually finding out that's absolutely not true. Where we've had cover crops, it's actually speeding it up due to that increased biological activity in our, in our farms. Uh, our soil will never dry out. Well, if that's the case, if, we gotta, if we're in a uh, wet situation, that's when we need to make sure we have the right cover crop established. And then uh, cover crops lead to increased herbicide use. We actually have some people that'll plant cover crops green or plant 
like beans into the rye like I showed before, and then they'll come out with a roller, a crop roller. They may not use any any herbicides at all in, in a lot of situations. So, and there's a lot of folks really working on, on the no-till organic thing, and I think that that's gonna show some positive things down the road. Uh, and then cover crops just don't work here. We hear that all the time. Everywhere I'm at, I hear somebody say that, and, and I usually can take them to somebody within 20 miles and show them somebody that's making it work. So that's one of the good things, but that's just what some of these farmers are going through is they just, they, they have these beliefs in their head that they just won't work. Uh, so a big reason, uh, we, another thing we always hear is, we always hear, well, we tried no-till 20 years ago and it didn't work. Uh, so why am I gonna try it again? What's the difference between now and then? Well, we didn't have the equipment that we do today. Uh, we don't, we didn't have the technology and we didn't have the cover crops. And the cover crops might be the biggest tool to making that work. Now there are a few farmers that made it work, but there was a lot of them that tried it and, and ended up stepping away from it. And now luckily we do have a lot that are starting to come back. So this is a, another op option that we did. We had 55 acres in our area that was planted. August 15th, just a simple rad, uh, mix of oats, radish, turnips, and rapeseed. Uh, they grazed cows on it for 45 days. Um, and then for 45 cows on it for 65 days, uh, we left good cover in that situation to protect the soil through the winter. The seed cost was below $15 an acre. Uh, the seed was broadcast and then they just vertical tilled it in. And in that situation, it was probably okay because they were using it to plant another seed. Uh, they harvested 76 bushel of soybeans in that situation, uh, which had broke their previous record by 6.3 bushels. So now we've got farmers starting to do some interseeding, and I just wanted to show this picture because this is one of the one of the tools that we're using, uh, and this is really new for a lot of farms. But they're actually going out when the corn is below knee high, and they'll start establishing their cover crops at that time and grow it at the same time. And we got a lot of farms trying to get away from growing monocultures, and this is a good way to get away from growing it. So this is what it looks like. Now imagine what that's gonna do for, for rain or water quality uh, in terms of just filtering the water when we get get rain throughout the rest of the winter. Uh, you're gonna be able to capture that and, and, and hold those nutrients there. What's that gonna do for the wildlife? You know, that's, that's another question that, that we don't even really talk about very often, but there's gonna be a lot more, you know, you're gonna see more deer and pheasants and, and a lot more of the native habitat or wildlife that are out there as well. Here's an, another couple options that we see people doing. I have a lot of producers that are using just old, older drills and they're retrofitting them so they can get into the corn. Uh, there's a, a, on your left, there's a tool called the, a side dress applicator and that's where they're going in and, and implementing some nit or adding some nitrogen mid season rather than putting it all on at once and losing some of it. They're actually, there's a lot of farms that are going to this so they can add nitrogen uh, multiple times and then they're seeding the cover crop at the same time. And then that cover crop would be going through that green box and then coming down through those white pipes and that's how they're getting their seed established. And here's just another, this is another homemade one. Um, and this is just taking a lot of old parts off of old equipment that they found in a farm uh, fence line and now they're using that again and, and getting cover crop seeded. So this is, I think this is the last one of these uh, different interseeders that we're using to get cover crops planted in the corn early on. And here's just a picture of, uh, of the results of that. And that was actually after it was grazed. So uh, we've got a lot of opportunity to get stuff done. Um, here's another one that we are doing. We're working a lot on, on different row spacing and what can we do to change. If we've got a farm that's absolutely not gonna change from corn and soybeans, but we still want to get the diversity. Now we're starting to see more wider rows. And, and we're actually working with a lot of farms throughout the entire Midwest to actually try a straight 60 inch rows. And for a lot of our farming situations, we're either on 20, 22, or 30 inch rows in the area. So this is basically taking the same amount of corn seeds and putting them in half as many rows. That gives us a, a huge opportunity. This was actually two thirds as many rows, but as I said, we're going more to the straight 60s and this is giving us a very good opportunity to get a lot of diversity interseeded in there. And now we can start looking at maybe growing some of our own nutrients. Uh, we can start using more legumes in the middle. Uh, we can actually start using more of the pollinators, put some more flowers in there, and that's gonna give us a lot of benefit. Uh, so if we can do that, uh, this just really opens up everything for, uh, uh, 
for, for diversity and just different options for getting a cover crop established. So get to know your farmers. If you know, there's a group of farmers here in the in the table over there. Um, support regenerative ag. It, anytime you get a chance to talk to a farmer, uh, really ask them what they're doing to take care of their soil. Um, if you get a chance to buy a product from them, buy it directly from them. You know, uh, it, whether they're selling eggs or beef or or any kind of even sweet corn or something, do do whatever you can to uh, get in front of them and talk with them and. And the more support you guys can give to those farmers, the more the more difference you're going to make. Um, everybody can make a difference in, in cleaning this water and cleaning the environment. And it's really, as much as the farmers want to do it, um, it, it, they need your support as well. So I really urge you to do that. And then a little bit more about Soil RX and what I do. We're a cover crop and soil health consulting company. So as I said before, we're really focused on working with farms throughout the upper Midwest and helping them incorporate uh, covers and no-till on their operations. Uh, we also do some land management where we're focusing on, on connecting absentee landowners that are removed from the farms and connecting them with farms um, that, are, that are already doing some of these regenerative egg practices. Uh, we do some custom cover crop blending uh, and, and building recommendations. So you can learn more at our website at soilrx.net uh, we also have uh, Cover Crop Kings on YouTube. Uh, you can go on Facebook and you can find us uh, at, at SoilRx on Facebook and, and Twitter and Instagram as well. So with that, I thank you and, and uh, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, absolutely. So that's a great question. So how can we how can we grow more stuff locally? And, and that's where I get back to what I talked about before. Um, the big thing for farmers is, is is this whole farming thing has developed and really changed. Is farmers are not good marketers. So uh, that's really been their negative side. And, and I can tell you, almost every farmer would grow something if he had the ability to sell it. And and so that's where I urge you guys as a, as 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 an economy to come out and talk to the farmer and as a group and, and work with the farmers and, and ask them what could you grow I'd like to buy directly from you but I think it's I think it's really up to you guys to do that and I know there's more and more farms there's there's some farms back at farmers at the table that, that do have products that they could sell whether it's eggs or apples or beef or something like that but anytime you get the opportunity to kind of cut the middleman out there's definitely a benefit to that yes sir problems is absentee owners and uh, you know it's uh, uh, somebody uh, leasing the land is going to be much motivated to implement a lot of these things uh, just because it's not a long-term investment in practice. Uh, yeah, I've heard, I know people who are working on like model uh, leasing contracts and uh, standardized goals for uh, you know, uh, minimizing soil loss. Uh, you know, what are you doing and I guess, you know, what is the solution for uh, the absentee owner problem? Yeah, so that's a, that, that probably hits me my, right at home there. That's my goal. When I started Soil RX was to work with the absentee landowners. I thought there was a great opportunity there to educate those landowners. Because I think I, I saw the number recently and I think it was 70 or 80% of the land is going to change hands over the next 10 years. Now, some of that's going to be from farmer to farmer. Uh, but we also know that there's going to be a lot more absentee landowners getting land, uh, whether it be through investors, whether it be through uh, several generations. Uh, now there's a lot of there's a lot of people that own land in, in different cities, and now that land's going to go to their another generation, where the the first generation maybe knew the farmer, uh, but now some of the people that own this land aren't going to have any idea of who the farmers are. And I can tell you as a as a land owner that I'm sure it's very scary to kind of demand that these farming practices change on their land when they don't know any other farmers. And that's really what we're trying to offer as a service to be able to say, hey, 
we'll actually find the people for you and we'll make sure that they're taking care of the land. And, and, and another thing that we've been seeing in Minnesota is a lot of landowner meetings uh, where we're educating the landowner how to do some of this stuff, how to have the conversation with their tenant. And if their tenant absolutely doesn't want to do it, how to find somebody else. And, and I, we've just tried to remind all these landowners that they are really the ones in charge. And if you as a landowner want to have your land farmed in a regenerative practice like this, um, it's, it, it's absolutely up to you because if, if your tenant won't, somebody else would absolutely do it. And, and in almost any area, we could find somebody that's already starting to implement these practices and, and would jump on board to take over management of that land. Um, so I think education to the landowner is the biggest thing. And if you start showing them the erosion losses that they're seeing, uh, if they just looked at it as an investment, they can't continue to see losses like they're seeing. So it's it's really easy on the on the business side of it to say we we got to we got to make some changes. Um, even if they had to consider taking a twenty thirty dollars less rent, there'd be a huge benefit because I think we're losing about fifty dollars an acre worth of topsoil a year. So there would be an advantage to to doing some of that. Yes. That's a touchy subject over there. Um, it, I can tell you, it doesn't. It, there's a negative effect. Um, the buffers, the way the ditch system is set up in Minnesota, I can tell you that a lot of it is uphill. So there's there's a lot of buffers that were put in on ground that's going up because the, the banks were built up before they built the ditches, so they don't see a lot of benefit from it. But if I went back to one of those earlier slides and we saw the drainage ditch with the soil there, we are able to catch some of that through the wind erosion, uh, but we're not really filtering it. So the big thing with the farmers in Minnesota with their buffer initiative is they still have to pay taxes on that land. They still have to do a lot of that stuff, but they don't get to use it as a uh, income producing property. So that is the biggest issue uh, with, with, that's the big thing that the farmers have against that that situation. So if there was a way to, to change that, I think there wouldn't be a problem at all because um, a lot of the farmers that I worked with were, they kind of had one set up anyways. There was a lot of ditches that were already set up, but there was, for every one of those, there was also one that they were overhanging the plow into the into the drainage ditch and trying to get every square inch, you know. So um, there's definitely a negative, a negative effect there, but uh, I think we're they're finding ways around it. They're, they are able to hay it or do some things like that. So there's some benefits there, but they got to leave it wide enough so they can get hay equipment through there too. So, yes. Akin to that, can you say anything about the interplay between drain tile systems and regenerative practices? Yeah. So I can tell you I'm not against drain tile and, and, and actually a little bit of drain tile is going to help benefit that. We would rather see the, the water go down through the soil and get purified through the soil. Uh, there's nothing that purifies water like soil does. So if we can catch, take that water down through, um, and then if we have regenerative practices, we should have caught most of the nutrients. Uh, so what's coming out through the tile lines are going to be a lot cleaner water. I can tell you that a lot of folks will tell you that we don't need to tile anymore because we've increased the water infiltration so dramatically that we and we have better soil structure that we just don't need to. Now, with that being said, there's some areas that absolutely that we wouldn't be farming at all if they had no tile. So I think the, my home county, I, I had heard the number at one point in time was 93% wetlands, and I think there's one lake left. So. Uh, that's where some of that 21,000 to 10,000 comes in, I suppose. But uh, anyway, so yeah, there's there's definitely a value in, in tile, but uh, we can start to use less of it. And, and that's going to help benefit the flooding and, and water, uh, you know, the cleanliness of the water, water quality dramatically. Yeah, that's, there's been, for every, for every one farmer that will, there's four that won't, you know, and just because it's so different, and, and fear is their biggest thing, and, and they're, 
They're scared of not being able to maintain their profits. And, and the years ago, there was, or within the last 10 years, I should say, there was some data showing that they were going to get some big yield drags if they planted cover crops into, or planted corn into cover crops. Well, really, it was a mismanagement issue. So they planted the wrong cover crop ahead of the wrong cash crop. And then they were, so that they were not able to get the yields that they wanted to get. So that really slowed down things. And that was university research. And we see that a lot with some of the university research. So a lot of our on-farm research has been way more beneficial. And when we can show farmers what other farmers are doing, especially local farmers, there's a benefit to that, but it does take a process and it doesn't happen overnight. So we're, we're getting there, but it, that slide definitely gets them to open their eyes up and, and usually gets them to try a field, but they won't go all in right away. Yes. And that's in a no-till and cover crop environment. We'll just do one last question, Becky. How long does it take to switch over from utility to a cover crop? As long as it takes to get your mindset switched. <laughs> it can be pretty quick. Uh, it used to. We used to have a four-year uh, transition when you transitioned into no-till before you could get your yields back. And we're able to do that with cover crops and no-till right away. And we don't have to make a lot of added, uh, have a lot of added expense with our equipment. Sometimes there's going to be a few things that would might might help ease the process, but but there's absolutely some things that we don't. Have. There doesn't need to be a timeliness or a, a three four year overlay. We can do it pretty quick. Yeah, uh, I can tell you one thing, you know, the, the, in the new farm bill, you know, the new farm bill is great, but there's still a very small percentage of it actually goes to the farmers. So, and that's something that's not really talked about a whole lot, but I think, uh, I thought I saw 76% or something like that is actually to nutrition. So, uh, they don't get as much as everybody talks about. So, um, and, and there is some cases where some get more, but in, and they are starting to dish out for conservation. I think it was just 6% was for conservation is what I found uh, in the new farm bill. So as well as there, there is some good things and that's 6% of a big chunk of money. So there's some benefits there, but we could always see it a little bit higher.